Merry Christmas to all the Orthodox Christians around the world who are celebrating Christmas Day, but who I hope are still tuning in in this evening to the mother of all talk shows. Nothing Orthodox about Bill Clinton. Bill Clinton likes them young, says a message from Ghislaine Maxwell, the jailbird, the paramour of Jeffrey Epstein in the Epstein Files. Humiliation piled on humiliation for the so-called Duke of York, not so grand nowadays. The Queen's son is disgraced, but could he be heading for the slammer? Is that even legally possible in the United Kingdom? Who knows? Everything is up for grabs including all those underage girls in the Virgin Islands, in Florida, in New York City, everywhere that Jeffrey Epstein had a house. Mind you, it was some consolation that the former Prime Minister of Israel, Ehud Barak, visited Epstein 36 times. Most of those times after he'd already been convicted of transporting children and having illegal sex with those children. Makes you wonder what they found to talk about, doesn't it? It's going to be a bumpy night, I promise you. It's the mother of all talk shows. You are listening to the mother of all talk shows podcast with George Galloway. The Epstein files reveal that the judge involved ordered Ghislaine Maxwell to search all of her electronic devices for the word association Prince Andrew and the word dildo. Now, I know that Prince Andrew is a bit of a tool and not the sharpest one in the box, but the judge ordered it nonetheless and Maxwell's lawyers had to comply. We don't yet know why, and we don't yet know what the results were. But the rich and famous, infamous, are all running for cover. Those that were peripatetic around news studios on just about anything else that didn't concern them. Yes, you, Lord Mandelson, Keir Starmer's prime consultant and leading advisor, That's Peter Mandelson for the uninitiated. Now he's a lord, but once upon a time, he was a bosom buddy and shopper with Jeffrey Epstein. Peter Mandelson has not said a single word about any of the kerfuffle around uh, the Epstein files breaking all over the world this week. I wonder why not. Neither has Piers Morgan frequently photographed with the aforementioned Ghislaine Maxwell. Usually got plenty to say, nothing to say about the Epstein files. Bill Clinton has not yet appeared on national television to say, brimming with faux sincerity, I did not have sex with that minor. But it's early days, yet this story is going to run and run. I'm not actually all that interested, you'll have to forgive me, in the sex lives of other people, but I'm deeply interested in what the Prime Minister of Israel found to talk about on his 36 visits to Jeffrey Epstein, and why the former Prime Minister of Israel, Ehud Barak, established a company with Jeffrey Epstein years after the Epstein child molesting, trafficking paedophile had been convicted in court of committing sexual offenses against minors. That would normally put most prime ministers, former prime ministers of American allies of Western countries, that would normally put them off uh, the uh, close company of Jeffrey Epstein. On the contrary, it seems to have attracted the attention 
of Ehud Barak, and I'm wondering why. Aren't you? Aren't you interested in where the tapes are that were collected and deposited in the multiple homes of Jeffrey Epstein, where there were secret cameras everywhere, particularly in the bathrooms, Andrew, particularly in the massage parlors, particularly in the bedrooms where the rich and famous presumably slept and maybe more than slept. These tapes are presumably in the hands of the FBI. When will the American people get to see them? When will the people of the United States, indeed the people of the world, get to know what's on the tapes, who's on the tapes, with whom, doing what to, with whom? These are legitimate questions to which there are as yet no answers. As I say, they're welcome to blank out uh, the private parts of Ehud Barak, probably an unimpressive sight. But I want to know what Ehud Barak was talking to Epstein about. I want to know what the former Prime Minister of Israel had to do with this sex offender. I'm also mildly interested in what could possibly have attracted Lord Peter Mandelson, who famously plays for the pink team and cannot have been much interested, if at all, in the bevy of beauties around Jeffrey Epstein's swimming pool. I better not say any more on that. The truth is, these rich and powerful people, some of them still very powerful, Mandelson could scarcely be more powerful. He's the number one advisor to the leader of the opposition who looks set to be the next Prime Minister of Britain, although a week is a long time in politics and it's 52 weeks possibly until the British general election. But if Keir Starmer wins, then Lord Mandelson is but a heartbeat away from the Prime Minister of Britain. When Starmer was asked, didn't Peter Mandelson have questions to answer about his close and long association with Jeffrey Epstein? Starmer, the leader of the opposition, answered, I know no more than you know. Well, why don't you know more than we know, Starmer? Don't you have a responsibility to know if your chief advisor was committing sex crimes on his visits to the sex criminal Jeffrey Epstein? Don't you have a duty to know more than we do? What kind of answer is that from potentially the next Prime Minister of Britain? Bill Clinton likes them young. Well, is the Pope a Catholic? Do bears defecate? in the woods, I suppose the question is how young is young, Bill? And did young mean illegally young, bearing in mind the different ages of consent within the United States, never mind in the misnamed Virgin Islands, and a different one in London, where Prince Andrew is accused, amongst other jurisdictions, of having slept with a young girl below the age of consent in some of those places, who was moreover forced to do so, who was moreover allegedly a, a sex slave in the employ of Jeffrey Epstein. These are deep and dark and troubled waters, but they may not be unconnected to the political situation that we face today. After all, if Israel and Prime Minister Ehud Barak is in possession of compromat, of compromising material on the American political class, on Peter Mandelson, on the Duke of York, well, it would place Israel in a strong position not to put too fine a point on it in commanding the continuing feverish, fanatic, 
loyalty of the British and American political class, wouldn't it? If these people knew that there were videotapes of them committing heinous sexual offences against underage children in the possession of Mr. Barak, in the possession of the Mossad, well, it would buy the silence to say the least, wouldn't it? Now, since South Africa, blessed South Africa, asked the International Court of Justice to rule that Israel is committing acts of genocide in Gaza and to order them to cease and desist, which if they refused, would have severe consequences for their international relations with a whole number of governments. Presumably, Joe Biden would go on uh, kissing and cuddling Netanyahu. Presumably, Blinken also. But there are many countries in the European Union that would legally not be able to continue their relations with Israel were it found guilty of acts of genocide, were it refusing to cease and desist from those acts. There are many governments in Europe that would be legally bound to break all relations with Israel were that to happen. So God bless South Africa. You may well ask why South Africa? Well, apart from other reasons, South Africa was a byword for apartheid. Israel is the new apartheid state. The leaders of the African National Congress, which I gave some of the best years of my life to help win their heroic struggle against that apartheid system. I was a bit part player, a minor player, but I was the only person on the left in the whole of Great Britain who traveled the length and breadth of apartheid South Africa, acting on behalf of the African National Congress. I've been disappointed many, many times over the subsequent decades at the performance of the ANC across many different issues. But I have never been more proud of the ANC, more proud of South Africa, now that they are the one country that had the balls to invoke the Genocide Convention to ensure that next week the court will begin to hear South Africa's 80-page case, which is a must-read. It is a masterpiece of jurisprudence, a masterpiece of narrative. And it makes a case which is unanswerable in the mouths of the Israeli leaders themselves. You know, Israel's very worried about the case for the reasons that I just mentioned. But how they're going to even muster an answer to the South African charges is simply beyond me because all South Africa has done is tabulate the genocidal frenzied statements made by Israeli government ministers, made by Israeli army officers, and clipped the video of them carrying out the very genocidal acts that they were promising, threatening to commit. So for me, this case is game, set, and match. And if the judges of the ICJ are judges at all, rather than political hirelings, if these judges care about the reputation of their court, they can do no other than to find Israel guilty. What has Israel done since South Africa tabled this case before the ICJ, well, they've stepped up the genocide 
three hours ago, this evening, one 2,000 pound bomb murdered 80 people in one house, one house in Gaza, 80 people sheltering there, have been wiped out, all of them from the same extended family, most of them women and children. 40% of all the people killed in the last 93 days were small children. I'm not even talking about the 17-year-olds. I'm talking about small children, babies, sucklings, in the words of Benjamin Netanyahu when he promised, threatened, promised, to wipe them all out, every man, woman, child, suckling, goat, camel, ass. He said it on television. There's no getting out of that one. Since Blinken told Netanyahu that the United States wanted to see a reduction in the civilian casualties in the Gaza Strip and in the West Bank, those casualties have ballooned upwards. Israel is killing anything, everything that moves. The Al Jazeera reporter in Gaza, who'd already lost his wife, his son, his daughter, his grandchildren, who had already been wounded himself today, lost the last of his sons, also a journalist, in a targeted, deliberate attack. The first casualty of war, it said, is the truth. But in truth, the first casualty of this war is the truth teller. They are hunting down those that are taking the pictures, those that are recording the footage, those that are witnessing the carnage precisely because they know that they are guilty of genocidal acts. I'm going to say something that's very painful to me to say as a student of the Second World War. Israel is killing children faster than the Nazis in the death camps at Auschwitz and Treblinka. That is a statistical fact in the time that I have been speaking. Palestinian children have been murdered, maimed. Many will be amputated. A thousand have already been amputated without any anesthetic. Can you even imagine such a thing? Famine. Most of the people starving in the world today are starving in Gaza, a place just a few hours flying time from here and just a few minutes from the Elysian fields of the Israeli kibbutzim where fruit and vegetables hang in abundance. Disease is on the march and is actually now infecting the Israeli soldiers in the Strip, which might be why uh, they have begun to withdraw from the northern part of Gaza in significant numbers. Although that might also be because the Palestinian partisans on the ground in their own territory, in their own midden heap, in their own rubble, in their own slums, were knocking hell out of the pampered Israeli invasion force. But don't think because they're withdrawing soldiers that that means in any way a respite on this orthodox Christmas day for the poor Palestinians trapped in the cage because when they're not fighting on the ground, they're doing their killing from the air. Gaza is a death camp. The guards 
are murdering the captives. And the world is not just looking away. The world is facilitating it, at least our part of the world. Stay tuned. This is the mother of all talk shows. You are listening to the Mother of All Talk Shows podcast with George Galloway. Why is Israel in the Eurovision Song Contest? Why does Israel play in the European Football Championships? These are questions I've asked myself virtually all of my adult life. But I'm certainly asking them more pointedly now. Russia has been blackguarded and banned from all international fora, all international competition. But Israel is still welcome to the Olympic Games in France this year? Seriously? When they're up before the ICJ for genocide? I mean, Hitler had Olympic Games in Berlin in 1936. If we'd known his intentions then, would we really have gone to those Olympic Games? Or are they selective about which invasions, which occupations, which genocides they care to condemn and sanction? Well, who better to ask this than Nima Rudsari, the football journalist, the football pundit and co-host of the Italian Football Podcast. Nima, welcome back to the show. You are such a welcome guest. Your interview with me last year was enormously popular. I'm sorry to bring you back on, as it were, a non-football topic. Uh, But answer me, please. Why would... Israel be welcome in Paris at the Olympic Games. Why are Israel even playing in the European Football Championships? Well, first of all, it's good to be with you, and Happy New Year, George. I'm, I'm, I'm glad to be with Happy you. I wish Year. it was in happier circumstances. Um, look, we. This is something that those of us who are a little bit perhaps more cynical, <laughs> and I don't suggest that you are one of those people, would say is is just par for the course. On the 24th of February 2022, when Russia invaded Ukraine, politically supported by Belarus, four days later, the FIFA Council and the UEFA Executive Committee suspended all Russian teams, including Russian youth teams, for the actions of the Russian and Belarusian Belarusian government. The IOC set up a solidarity fund on the 28th of April, 20, uh, 28th of February 2022. They issued recommendations following a resolution to not allow Russian and Belarusian athletes and officials to participate in any competitions under the umbrella of the Olympic movement, which included the Paralympic sports. Just imagine that. Yeah. The IOC literally yeah. wrote, and I'm quoting from their homepage now, The Olympic movement is united in its sense of fairness not to punish athletes for the decisions of their government if they are not actively participating in them. We are committed to fair competitions for everybody without discrimination. The current war in Ukraine, however, puts the Olympic movement in a dilemma. While athletes from Russia and Belarus would be able to continue to participate in sport events, many athletes from Ukraine are prevented from doing so because of the attack on their country. Well, back in 2018, the Palestinian national football team has, according to some reports, back then already lost nine national players alone due to loss of limbs. That was 2018. We're now three months into an unhinged, industrial scale exercise in mass murder where some reports claim over 30,000 civilians have been killed two thirds of them women and children on top of the starvation imposed on Gaza and the Palestinian people there as a tactic of war 
This is not with this is without mentioning the systematic bombardment of hospitals whereby now, whereby now death and famine is joined by severe outbreaks of illnesses due to the lack of adequate adequate health care available due to this illegal blockade. So the IOC, UEFA, FIFA and all these other organizations have painted themselves into a corner. As I and many of us said at the time in when speaking to media organizations, when we spoke out against the politicization of sports and football in particular, because we said at the time we warned, if you cross this bridge, you will be forced to apply this in political matters that you're not comfortable with in applying. Well, now that shoe is very much on the other foot. That is, if you're so lucky as to have two feet, unlike many athletes in Gaza who have had their feet and other limbs blown off by Israel, but in, in weapon attacks given to them by Joe Biden after he bypassed Congress just the other week. So the question is now, is the IOC a NATO toy or is it truly an international organization for all of sports? Do all lives truly matter or, do NATO, or does the NATO cause the jour life matter more? Many have asked what to do. Well, now we must put pressure on these people to prove us, the cynics, wrong that all lives do matter. Israel must be suspended from all sporting activities with effect of immediately until they end the illegal occupation of not one, but three countries, which they have occupied mm. for decades, on top of being an apartheid racist state. Well, that's an extraordinarily powerful uh, answer to my uh, question. Uh, so powerful that you're, you're left to wonder uh, why no one has attempted to uh, square that circle. Why no one in the so-called mainstream media <laughs> is even raising the fact that Russia was banned within days and Israel has killed 30,000 civilians, overwhelmingly women and children, and nobody's even raising the question of a ban. Nima, what, what if they're convicted of genocide in the ICJ? Are we going to have a genocide 11 playing in the Euros? Are we going to have a genocide um, javelin throwers and, and middle distance runners competing? in France at the Olympics. This is ludicrous, isn't it? It's beyond ludicrous. It's utterly bizarre. It feels like we're in, in some sort of parallel universe where up is down and down is up. Look, what, they, uh, what we are seeing now, given that Belarus, without, without actually being involved in the war, have, were also suspended, and these, the, the federations of many countries, including especially Sweden in winter sports, have been vocal about their opposition to that. They now have to answer to this. They are now responsible for this because their governments are actively aiding and abetting this genocide. And it is a genocide. I personally, much like your viewers who have voted in the poll, I don't believe that Israel will be convicted of, of genocide because of how the state of the political status quo as it is. But the fact of the matter is, I, I hope that you're right and, and that, you know, that you proved me wrong. What you said, I was listening to what you said earlier, that they have no choice but to convict them. I personally am a little bit more cynical. I don't think, I, th I think they'll just simply find a way to, to legally weasel their way out of it as they have always done. But let's say that they do do it exactly as you say, or if they do, if they are unable to, uh, to, to to if they are on, if they don't get convicted do you, what possible weight does this have in the world in the in the eyes of the world everyone has seen it we've seen people all over the world from stockholm to washington to south africa to australia everyone is out in millions marching against the systematic murder and extermination of the palestinian people while everyone was celebrating christmas and, and new years and we're supposed to just ignore it and move on to the next thing. Well, we're not moving on. Israel has to be banned. Ne it's as simple as that. Nima, ne ne what, what, there's a, by the way, there's a petition 
being got up by uh, Varoufakis' uh, outfit, uh, DM25. Uh, people should uh, sign it. Many thousands are uh, doing so, so you can actually physically do something uh, about this. There it is. They are suspending Israel from international sports. I urge you all to uh, sign that uh, petition. Uh, bit.ly forward slash Israel ban. B-I-T dot L-Y forward slash Israel ban. I encourage everyone uh, to lend their support to that. But Nima, uh, the, 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 the truth is that all these countries that told us that politics should be kept out of sport, something that in an ideal world, uh, I would agree with, actually really mean keeping some politics out of sport and other politics very firmly in it. I was at a Scotland game where all the corner flags were Ukrainian flags, where all the uh, furniture, where all the billboards were in Ukrainian colors. And Graham Souness actually said that Scotland should let Ukraine win so that they would go through rather than Scotland. How's that for politics? in sport. Yet, yeah, as you know, the Celtic supporters uh, caused massive fines on Celtic Football Club for the simple act of holding up Palestinian flags in the crowd. This is all so brazen. I'm wondering how nobody but thee and me are recognizing it. Well, you see, that's that's the thing, George. I think more than thee and me are recognizing it. You see, I think the hypocrisy of it, this so-called rules-based order, which is basically my rules today and I've ch changed them whenever I feel like it, everyone has seen it. It's out in the open. No one's buying it anymore. It's absolute nonsense. It's nothing more than whatever they feel like doing at the day of choosing. And they don't feel that they should be held to account. Well, the world isn't buying it anymore. The multipolar world is here. The, the, the age of where they could do whatever they want, where NATO countries could do whatever they want, spearheaded by the United Kingdom and, of course, the United States, where they could do whatever they want, however they want, whenever they want, in any manner they want, and no one can hold them to account, is over. This has been a ginormous failure for them. The only thing that Israel and NATO is good at doing is murdering women and children. Militarily, they are being destroyed in battles between militaries in Gaza and in and around the area. So all they are, and they have lost the entire narrative, so they have nothing left. And therefore, it's incredibly important. You mentioned that. What is it we can do? Well, here is something everyone can do. Everyone who has the internet can do this. Go on and sign that letter. Read that letter. And I, and I, and I really hope you bring on the author of that letter on your show, the great Katarina Pietkovic, a legal scholar with two PhDs in, sport, in law, a brilliant legal sports mind, who can explain in far better detail than I can the legal framework supporting this. She's, she's, she worked day and night tirelessly putting this together, and now it's out there. You all can do it. Go out and sign it. Make, prove me wrong. Prove me the cynic and prove George right. Settle this bet between us. Prove George right that they will have to do something here. And prove me as a cynic and make me look stupid and say, you were wrong, Nima. They, they, all lives do matter. Go now and sign that letter. Israel has to be banned from the International Sporting Committee for as long as it is an apartheid state, occupies three countries, and continues to impose to this this mass murdering genocide on the on the on the Palestinian population. That's what you can do. Don't ask what you can do. Don't let these feelings of hopelessness consume you in your in your in your in your solitude. There is something you can do. You can go to demonstrations. You can sign petitions. You can organize. On grassroots, uh, in, on grass, a grassroots level, and tell the rulers that they are ruler of our minds and hearts no more. Finally, Nima, uh, there's going to be trouble in Paris at the Olympic Games if oh, Israel show up with the blood still running uh, in profusion. 
in not just in Gaza, but in Jerusalem, in the West Bank, in Lebanon, where today, I mean, I saw the film. I saw the white phosphorus bombs landing in a town in South Lebanon. A, a clear crime under international law in Lebanon, uh, in the West Bank, in Jerusalem, and God knows where else by the time we get to uh, the Olympic Games. Maybe in the Yemen, the poorest country, one of the, if not the poorest country in the whole world. Maybe on fire with blood everywhere. And we're really going to see Israel at the Olympic Games in Paris? Is Macron mad? Well, <laughs> I think that's a trick question because I do think I don't think Macron is mad, but I do think he and the rest of these so-called supine gentlemen and ladies who lead the EU and the and Britain and the rest of the West are are not mad, but they are bought. I'll come out and say it. They they do they work at the behest of the oligarchy, and the oligarchy wants this. Otherwise, this would not be happening. Now. I do think, again, prove me wrong, I think that Israel will turn up at the Olympics. I think they won't even bother to go ahead with a song and dance of them forcing them to participate under a neutral Olympic flag, but they will force them, but they will allow them to participate and they will call like they have always done, accuse everyone who speaks out of being anti-Semitic. But the problem is these old tricks don't bite anymore. It's, it's out in the open. No one believes a word they say. And therefore, it's important now more than ever when their lies have been exposed, when they have been exposed for being the mass murdering, genocidal fascist hacks that they are. Now's the time to push on even harder. Now's the time to expose everyone and say, if you really believe in the Olympic movement and your anti-discrimination, prove it. Don't just talk a pretty, pretty sentence. Prove it with your actions. Ban Israel now. I said finally, but um, I, another question occurred to me, and you're a good man to answer it. Your football podcast is the, is the gold standard. There are hundreds, many hundreds, of players whom I hazard a guess feel the pain of the people in Palestine very keenly indeed. I could name names, no need to. There are hundreds of Arab players in top flight football around Europe and uh, elsewhere. There are even more hundreds of Muslim uh, players. Uh, where is the John Carlos moment is, uh, is what I'm thinking of. Where is the athlete who will don the, the black glove and stand on the podium will will do something, say something powerful enough to jolt at least their own fan base into uh, discussing uh, this and these issues. Well, we saw what they did to poor Youssef Atal, the Algerian footballer in France who handed him a suspended sentence for reposting a video claiming he was anti-Semitic when he was critical of what Israel was doing. We've seen it in the past before. This is what they do. They reign. They are like the mafia. They reign by terror. As soon as somebody pick, uh, speaks out, they go after him in such a way that they silence him. They take away his livelihood. They find them. They do. They throw everything that they can at them so that they can deter, so they can deter anyone else from speaking up after them. But the question now remains, how many more people have to die and is your money really that good? To paraphrase a Bob Dylan song, which I know you love as well. Wow. Nima, I could talk to you all night and many of the viewers <laughs> are saying they wish I could. Let's talk again sooner. Thank you very much for joining us on the mother of all talk shows. Well, what do you think of that? A quick break and I'll be right back. You are listening to the Mother of All Talk Shows podcast with George Galloway. Richard Medhurst is one of our most popular guests, and he knows and finds the words, particularly to a younger audience, 
he finds the words to convey exactly what's going on in the world. And therefore, we are very glad to have him back. Richard, welcome uh, to the mother of all talk shows. Let me, let me start, uh, as it were, far from your uh, home ground uh, in the Levant. Let me start uh, in the Yemen. Let me start in the Red Sea. We keep hearing blood-curdling threats from, amongst others, uh, the jumped-up twerp who passes for Britain's Minister of Defense, that we're going to go to war with Yemen. With whose army? I have no idea. Uh, what's happening in the Red Sea now? Hi, George. Thanks for having me on. Uh, it's great to be back on Moats. Um, yeah, I, I also don't know which army uh, is, is going to take the fight to Yemen because we tried this once already. Um, through the uh, Saudis and the Emiratis uh, supplying them with weapons to to do that, and they lost. And and you know this is not uh, a long time ago. It's it's barely been a year since they had to um, go and make peace with the um, with the Houthis and admit defeat. And uh, the situation in the Red Sea is very interesting because it, when it comes to Gaza, you have six fronts essentially. You know you've got G Gaza itself, you have the West Bank, um, and uh, you know the Jenny Marches Brigade, all the factions there that are giving the Israelis trouble because the, they're giving them trouble. Then you go to Syria, you go to Iraq, the American bases are under attack there. Uh, and then, of course, there's the Lebanese front and the sixth, and um, you know, which is last but, but not least important. Uh, that, that is this, the, the final front on, uh, you know, in this war. And it's, it is, uh, without a doubt, the most important because what the Yemenis have done is disrupt global trade. So uh, this is not just a question of um, punishing the Israelis financially for what they're doing in Gaza. Um, it's, it's also a question of making Western companies that do business with Israel uh, and the United States, which is supplying Israel, um, also feel the shock. And, and so now they have to go around, um, you know, uh, uh, South Africa and they have to go, or, you know, if they want to, want to cross the Mediterranean into the Suez Canal and down the Red Sea, they can't anymore. So what Yemen have done is effectively bring um, or take shipping back 200 years. Um, and uh, make no mistake, they're, they're, you know, they're suffering a lot more than they're letting on. Uh, this is deeply humiliating for the West. It's deeply humiliating for Israel. And uh, the fact that their international trade has been severed from, from the South, is, is, it's really, really uh, causing them a lot of trouble. The thing is that the Americans, they pulled back one of their ships from the Red Sea because, uh, because of several uh, developments. Uh, Hezbollah just the other day struck uh, the Israeli port uh, city of Eliat, which is on the Red Sea, showing you that that not just Hezbollah, and, uh, but also Iraq, both of them can reach that far south with the weapon systems that they currently have. And this is just a taste of, of, of what they actually possess. So the Americans have, are, are, are deeply afraid of, of you know, uh, of a, a wider confrontation, even though the Israelis certainly uh, want that. Uh, the Israelis are happy to drag the rest of the world down with them. But the resistance are constantly developing better and better weapon systems. And so the, the result is that this is not just uh, a defeat on the, on the economic front, but also militarily, these, these so-called great armies like the Israelis, um, uh, you know, uh, ourselves in Britain and the Americans, they, they, you know, we can no longer posture the way that we used to. Uh, and so uh, while there's a decline in, in Western capabilities, the, the capabilities of the resistance are just going up and up. And of course, this is, you know... Um, I haven't even mentioned uh, Iran as well, which is, uh, you know, in possession of far better um, missiles um, and systems than, than Hezbollah and the Yemenis have access to. Although, once again, it should be pointed out how far they have come. Uh, it is really a problem now that this war is on six fronts. I don't see how the Americans and the Israelis are going to dig themselves out of this one. It, 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 they're really pinned down. And any army knows that when you're pinned down on more than one front, you're in big trouble. Never mind six. Yes, uh, let's move then to uh, one of the most important of those six, uh, the one which uh, you and I are both very familiar with, namely Israel's northern border, Lebanon's mm -hmm. southern border. Uh, Israel is upping the ante. Uh, I mentioned earlier the white phosphorus attack, which I saw with my own eyes <laughs> landing on civilians in South Lebanon just this day, a very, as clear an act uh, of uh, war crime as it's possible to see. You could, you could see it coming out of the aircraft 
and landing on yeah. civilians in South Lebanon. They keep upping the ante. They are going further and further. They carried out uh, an illegal assassination uh, just uh, yeah. a few days ago in Beirut itself. How close are we to uh, an all-out war a la 2006 uh, to, between uh, Lebanon and Israel? Well, I, I don't want to make any predictions, but um, the you know in 2006, which is I mean it's quite some, it's almost 20 years ago now. Uh, even back then, uh, Hezbollah once again surprised um, the Israelis. Um, you know they were coming out of tunnels like you see Hamas doing now, um, and uh, the Israelis were paranoid of being taken out by these so-called ghosts, right? These tr- these troops that they would never see. Um, and of course, uh, uh, you know I was just talking about how uh, uh, Iraq and Lebanon can strike in the Red Sea. Um, the same thing in 2006 when they, they took out an Israeli ship. So the capabilities that they possess today um, uh, really frighten the Israelis. Uh, you know, it, it, they're, they're on a, the, the Israelis are at a stage now of decline, which you see in, in, in empires or colonies where they, they become uh, so desperate to cling on to power and to, to, to exist and to stay, um, uh, you know, to, to keep control of, of whatever place they've invaded, that they become irrational. Um, and they, they even end up, you know, it, it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. They start accelerating their own demise. This is what we're seeing right now. Uh, if it comes to, a, 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 you know, an all-out war, um, is, Israel is, is going to get hit very badly. And what they did with this assassination, um, I mean, th- this shows you that they're losing the war because the front, the primary front is, on Ga- is in Gaza, right? You have the, the Qassam fighters against the Israelis. They're, they're wiping the floor with them. Every day you have videos coming out of them taking out you know, ground units, bulldozers, tanks. It is so embarrassing. And so to distract from this, the Israelis have gone and carried out these assassinations. Um, you know, Salah Haruri, he was uh, the deputy leader of, of the Hamas political bureau. And uh, he was mentored by Qasem Soleimani. And it, the, the date... Uh, you know, they assassinated um, Haruri on the anniversary of the assassination of Soleimani. That's not a coincidence. That was on purpose. It was to provoke um, the resistance. And then, of course, the same day, they also bombed this memorial service that they had for Soleimani in Iran. And then they claimed it was ISIS, which we all know is an Israeli and, Amer- and, and an American proxy. And then they, they did an assassination of Mousavi, who's an, an Iranian general advising Syria against al-Qaeda and, and ISIS. And then they also... Um, of course, ca- carried out an assassination of the PMU in Iraq. And so these are Netanyahu's way of saying, I'm capable of doing things. Uh, yeah, okay, but they, they, they're they not going to win him the war. I mean, um, Sheikh Ahmad Yassin was also taken out um, by the Israelis. Did the resistance become weaker? No, on the contrary. The same thing with Soleimani. Um, the resistance only became stronger. And this is because you can't defeat a resistance by killing one person because the entire population is sick of Israel's uh, oppression of of their occupation of these you know things like dropping white phosphorus which you just mentioned which are so commonplace um, and and yet the whole world seems not to see it uh, so you know you can't defeat that by murdering one person you have hundreds thousands ready to take that person's place um, and to continue the fight for liberation so uh, you know the last thing the Israelis want if they if they were thinking straight is a war with Lebanon they can barely handle the front I mean just yesterday the Hezbollah in retaliation hit. Um, uh, this uh, it's, it's actually an Israeli surveillance base. It runs uh, drone operations, uh, airstrikes, spy ops, um, Meron base, and it's at the highest point uh, in, in occupied Palestine. And uh, Hezbollah fired 62 um, ATGMs on it. And, uh, you know, there's no Iron Dome that can deal with these things. They're land to land. And so uh, 40 out of those missiles struck the Israeli base. And uh, for the last three months, the Isra- you know, the Israelis have had their surveillance posts, observation, observation towers. They're, they're blinded now on, their, uh, on the fence uh, with Lebanon. So this is just a small taste of what is yet to come uh, should the Israelis escalate uh, foolishly and, and make this, you know, problem deeper than it is now. Turning to the first front, uh, I said earlier uh, that uh, the withdrawal of substantial numbers of uh, ground troops from uh, the northern part of Gaza uh, mm-hmm. is, is partly because of the, the spreading disease, fungal disease, that they have picked up in Gaza, a disease which has been Uh, the result of the destruction of water and sewage and electricity as a matter of deliberate policy. 
but to which the Israelis have not been affected before, uh, 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 exposed before. But the main reason, surely, is that the ground forces are being engaged by the Palestinian partisans of all factions and beaten yeah. in hand-to-hand -hand fighting in these very uh, auspicious topographical circumstances for a guerrilla army. I mean, it's very yeah. difficult to move tanks and artillery around the wreckage that Israel itself has made of 80% of Gaza. You have to get out yeah. your vehicle and come through the alley where the partisans are cutting them down in very large numbers. Yep, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, the, the, without a doubt, George, the tactics that we see Hamas uh, employing uh, today, uh, their, their strategy and style of guerrilla warfare, uh, without question, we will see people studying uh, these tactics 100, 200 years from now, without question, uh, because um, it, it is hard to show any guerrilla force uh, that has fought uh, uh, you know, this well, this effectively against an army with nuclear weapons. You know, the, the Israelis have a navy, they have an air force, they've got all this logistical and military and intelligence support from the West. Um, you know, Biden gave them $14 billion and they already get $3.8 billion a year. Uh, they're spoiled. They're spoiled. Silly. Um, and, and, and of course, you know, uh, shame, shamefully, Britain is also providing them support from Cyprus. Um, and so, you know, the point is that the, the Israelis get all this uh, um, material support, never mind the, the political support, for their war effort, and they still fail. What does that say about Hamas, who, who uh, are not only fighting, um, you know, uh, we should remember that the Hamas fighters are living in the same conditions that everyone else in Gaza is living in. Right. So they're also short on food. They're short on water. They're struggling physically. Uh, and yet they persevere. Nevertheless, they, they come out on top and they, they have proven the Israelis to be a weak, pathetic army. Uh, you know, it's been three months now that uh, uh, this episode of the, the occupation of, you know, of this war um, uh, has, has begun. And the Israelis have failed to take a single military objective. They said they want to defeat Hamas. Hamas is still here. They haven't even been, the Israelis haven't even been able to take out any uh, Hamas infrastructure, never mind defeat Hamas itself. They managed to kill one leader who wasn't even in Gaza. And uh, that was just uh, you know, to distract from, from, from their failures on the battlefield, the, the very ones you alluded to. And so uh, in addition to, to failing to defeat Hamas, they said they want to liberate hostages, but all they've done is kill hostages. Uh, you know, you've had 60, at least 60, that have been killed by Israel's own bombs. Um, and then another three that were killed by, by ground units um, when they tried surrendering. Uh, I mean, it, it's really a, an embarrassing, abysmal failure. And the only reason the war is still going is because Netanyahu needs, uh, you know, needs this war for his war cabinet to have a purpose. Otherwise, it would be dissolved. Uh, and then he would immediately be thrown into prison or face, you know, more, <laughs> more charges. You know, the, the second that this war finishes, one way or another, he's going to take the fall for everything. And then they, w they won't say, well, you know, it's Israel's fault as a whole, the occupation. They'll try and pin it on him as an individual. And he, he of course, shares a lot of the blame. Yeah. But Israel uh, tactically has failed, militarily has failed, and politically its reputation uh, is in tatters. He's just announced he's going to force his cabinet to take polygraph tests to prove uh, whether they're lying when they say that they're not leaking. Uh, it's a very jolly cabinet uh, atmosphere, I must say. Lastly, uh, Richard, the ICC, you know, you have to be black or be a Serbian uh, to get convicted at the ICC. But the right. ICJ is a slightly different kettle of fish, uh, a less politicized court one would have hoped, with a better class of judge, more mindful of their uh, legacy. That's why Israel is quite anxious about what's going to happen in the South mm -hmm. African case. What's your view on it? Well, I think, first of all, we should applaud South Africa. We should really thank um, our brothers and sisters there for, for taking this um, uh, to the ICJ because they have done not just uh, uh, Palestinians, but the whole world, um, a service by reminding everyone of their obligations of international law. And uh, unfortunately, it also has to be said not to commit genocide. Um, you know, so the ICC is geared towards prosecuting individuals. 
Um, and as you said, you, you only qualify for conviction if you're black or a Serbian. Uh, when it comes to the ICJ, uh, to the International Court of Justice, this deals with countries um, and it also rules on, on matters of opinion. And so um, right now, uh, the, the only reason the Israelis are, are, are going to uh, have to defend themselves, usually they, they wouldn't bother, is because they have you know, signed the Genocide Convention and they've also, um, um, if you've accepted previous rulings, you have to go before the court. It's like the Americans with Nicaragua. They were kind of forced into that situation, even though they didn't want to be in it. Um, although that was a different matter. But the ICJ will convene um, within a week uh, and it won't take them long to decide. And then if they dis- if they uh, rule that Israel is, um, uh, you know, uh, just if the case has merit, um, you know, ultimately the, the, the Americans at home, they will also be, the Biden administration will be in violation of the uh, Genocide Implementation Act. So this is how, how, uh, you know, uh, treaties are translated into law. It's like the Human Rights Act is the translation of the uh, Human Rights Convention in, in, in Britain. So, the, you know, the Biden administration will also be facing cases then because of the, their complicity, uh, their support, uh, material and, and political for Israel. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the, the problem is that even though the ICJ is the highest um, court in the UN uh, system, uh, you know, Israel has a tradition, has a habit, a nasty habit of just you know, giving the finger, uh, part of my French, to to a lot of the uh, UN rulings uh, that come from the Security Council or otherwise, um, and these are legally binding. It, you know, the, the 242 and, and and many others have told Israel to withdraw from the occupied territories, from Syria's Golan Heights, from the West Bank, from Jerusalem. They don't listen. They do not care. And e- even though the Americans back then let these resolutions pass or voted in favor of them. Um, you know, they've broken with them since. And, and Biden is more than happy to keep Donald Trump's positions uh, on, on Israel, which which says a lot. Um, and, you know, th- this uh, I can only hope that that something comes of this, because once the ICJ, if they they rule in favor of South Africa's case um, and the Palestinians, all countries uh, in, in the UN system, all UN member states and those who signed the convention will be obligated to also themselves prevent this genocide from continuing. It will have to cease and desist. Um, will they actually abide by it? Uh, I'm doubtful. I'm, I'm very doubtful. I think a lot of countries have shown themselves to be well, morally yeah. lacking. You know, they have uh, failed. Uh, mo- mo- morally, morally bereft. But uh, look at it this way, uh, Richard. The it, it actually could get some people off the hook. Uh, it could actually provide an exit ramp. Uh, from something that is turning out to be a thoroughgoing disaster for uh, virtually everyone concerned except the arms manufacturers. It might, in an election year, allow Joe Biden to fight an election without uh, this slaughter uh, continuing on his watch at his expense or at the taxpayer's expense. It might provide an off-ramp uh, for the European governments who might be then able to say, well, look, obviously we, we're legally obliged to uh, uphold this decision of the court, and so we can no longer uh, uh, send you weapons, money, uh, and support you diplomatically, and so on. It's just a thought, isn't it? Yeah, I, it, it is. Um, but I think they should still be held accountable nonetheless. Uh, and, I, and I know you, you would agree with me, but, uh, you know, it... If it does provide an off-ramp, uh, it should be for, uh, you know, to, to end the, the conflict, to stop the bombs. But then everyone responsible should still be prosecuted one way or another. Because, you know, if, if they are allowed to get away with this, um, I mean, you know, you, you can say goodbye to humanity itself. Because the, the, this is a crime on such an unprecedented scale. Um, you know, it's not like Cambodia. It's not like... Uh, you know, Rwanda, where where it wasn't clear what was happening until after the fact. We, we saw this genocide, you know, you and I and everyone on Earth, we saw it from the very moment it began. Um, and there have to be consequences. And I know Biden is fighting an election this year, and, and that's true. That's, that's also why he doesn't want an escalation in the Red Sea, because, uh, you know, Yemen's embargo is, is also going to affect oil prices. And they've struck Aramco in the past. If they want to, they can do it again. So he also has to take that into consideration. It certainly was during the um, midterms. And then, uh, you know, the only reason he got elected last time um, is because, uh, you know, black voters, Latino voters, young voters, voters of color came out and got him elected. Um, And they should remember, everybody involved should remember in November not to vote for Joe Biden, even if he stops this the next second, because, uh, you know, his legacy should forever be that he committed genocide in Gaza.
Brilliant, Richard. Always a pleasure. Thank you very much, Richard Medhurst, uh, the Thank independent you. journalist and political analyst. Let me take a quick break. I'm way past it. You are listening to the Mother of All Talk Shows podcast with George Galloway. Michael, in Dublin, uh, on the murder of yet another journalist in Palestine today. Go ahead, Mike. Happy Hog- Hogman Day to you, George. Yeah, I, I, I'm really upset about the way the journalists from the mainstream media are just ignoring their colleagues being yeah. murdered in vast numbers in mm. Gaza. It's absolutely... This young man, his father was uh, was injured, his, his brother was killed... Yeah, his his uh, grandchildren were killed. His mother young, was killed. Uh, his grandchildren were killed. Yeah, no, not not the young man's grandchildren. The, the father's grandchildren. Uh, his father was. Yeah, uh, exactly. He's a journalist there as well. Yeah, but the but the thing yes. about it is, I, 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 what shocks me is, is journalists all over. I'm here in Dublin, and every time we get a mention of Gaza which is not that often on our main news, on our main news channel here at RTE. The first thing they do is they regurgitate everything that happened on October 7th. That, that's the emphasis. That's the way they lead into the show. They lead into, the, into any reports about what's happening in Gaza. And it's uh, skimped, skimpy information we're getting here at all about the uh, the death rates and the, and the children being killed in Gaza, mm. and then the journalists. Uh, no, they're not. The they don't care. Like, they don't care about that, uh, Michael. They don't care about Palestinian children. Uh, they are stuck uh, where they want to be stuck on what happened on October seventh. Except they're not even bringing you the truth about what happened on October seventh. Where have you seen on the mainstream media that Israel possibly killed? hundreds of their own citizens as a matter of deliberate policy, a policy drawn up by Netanyahu. But they're not talking about the tens of thousands of women and children that have been killed in Gaza since October 7th or in the West Bank where there's no Hamas and no uprising, hundreds have been killed. I want to ask you a question, Mike. Uh, it might be tricky for you to answer. Some of my friends will find it a tricky question too. On St. Patrick's Day, should Irish politicians uh, be in the White House posing for grinning selfies uh, with the right-hand man of genocide, Joe Biden? Absolutely not. And what's what I am required what, when I'm on the show with you, George, I want to call on the Irish government and all our politicians of all classes and creeds, Sinn Fein, wherever, the whole lot of them, to support South Africa in their in their campaign in their uh, thing about genocide in, in, in Gaza. I want the politi- the Irish politicians mm. to come out and do that. Yeah, well, to be fair, Sinn Féin have, uh, have called for that, but the others resolutely oppose it. But I'm just wondering if Sinn Féin will be in the Oval Office on St. Patrick's Day. I hope not. Fias is in London on a now infamous interview with our friend Dr. Mustafa Barghouti and a certain... Julia, heartless brute. Go ahead, Fiaz. Yeah, I just um, I just wanted to talk about that uh, that despicable. Uh, uh, you can't you can't even call it a uh, uh, journalism uh, from, from uh, gutless brewer. I mean, then again, considering she's on talk TV, which is a uh, Murdoch-owned show, I wasn't really. Su- I, I can't say I'm really surprised to see her act in that way. But if that's the level of uh, journalism, if you could even call it that, then I, I guess it, I guess anyone can become a journalist just by, just by going on uh, any online network and uh, 
ranting about whatever fits your narrative. Yeah, she is, Fia's uh, heartless brute is uh, Piers Morgan with balls. She's what Piers Morgan would be if he had balls. And that's all she's got. She has what uh, in Yiddish we say, she has chutzpah, she has a brass neck. She knows nothing. She thinks Sinai is uh, the plural of sinus. She wouldn't know uh, a camel toe uh, from, uh, from the, the port of Elat. She doesn't know anything. She's pig thick. Ignorant, ignorant, pig thick. And the problem with wrestling with a pig is that you get covered in you know what. And the pig likes that. That's what pigs do. That's why I say, don't go on her show. Don't go on the emasculated, heartless brute, Piers Morgan's show. Don't go on talk TV. They're just using these things for clicks. Nobody was watching that channel. Nobody, 93 days ago. Now people are watching it because things like what happened to the gracious, distinguished, and gentle Dr. Mustafa Barghouti at the hands of this ignorant brute who knows nothing. I can tell you I've known her for 25 years. She knows nothing about anything in the Middle East. Suddenly they're spewing vile, bigoted, hate at a man like Barghouti. She did it for clicks. And we are giving them clicks by appearing on their show. Piers Morgan asked me a dozen times in the last 93 days to go on his show. I told him, no, you come on my show. Apart from anything else, a lot more people will see it. Poll results are as follows. 35,676 people voted. I hope someone has done the arithmetic because I cannot do so whilst speaking and broadcasting at the same time. I do know just from looking at it that it is actually a close run thing. When I get that number... I'll bring it to you. YouTube comments, History Discover says, if Americans demand my family accept our home split in half so immigrants can take it, then they must accept giving half of the USA to Mexican immigrants so they can come for a new homeland. And Melissa Dirlish says, George, we watched your Iraq war debate with Christopher Hitchens, thanks to Mohammed Hijab, who described it as an absolute classic and the only debate Christopher ever lost. Absolutely brilliant. Thank you, Melissa, and thank you to my friend Mohammed Hijab for circulating it. Uh, Paul in Kent has a message for the legend Erobus in New York. We better hear what it is. Paul, what would you like to say? Uh, can he lend me some money, please? I'm joking. I'm joking. no. I can't, uh, as a matter of fact, <laughs> I can't. Go ahead. But I just want to pay for his year's subscription to the moat. That's all. That's all. Okay, good man. Good man. Good man. And, uh, and what's George, your message for a robot? Uh, good man. Good man. Like you. Good man. And I love hearing it. I know he's a little bit <laughs> tight to the wind for cash. But um, if, the, if your guys phone me, I'll give details and, and pay for his year's subscription. If that's all right for you, of course. Ah, it's not only is it all right, it is a gracious and noble offer uh, that someone should take up so that Aerobus doesn't feel bad because we love him. As I say, he's the, he's the Barry White of the mother of all talk shows with the most beautiful basso profundo voice. And we miss him tonight because the last call is from the legend 
that is Norma in Bristol. Go ahead, Norma. Hello, George. Um, it's regarding Israel in the sport. And I was thinking that at least yes. Israel, like, they must participate at least under a neutral flag, like the Russians, but like the apartheid mm -hmm. of South Africa, they were banned from all the sports, especially rugby, weren't they, till they yeah. changed. But, I mean, it's much worse. Rugby and cricket, yeah. Israel. Yeah, I mean, apart from Israel being an apartheid state like that, they're much worse because of their... Um, genocide in Gaza and I mean I thought that Nima spoke very powerfully really um, I don't like it and I, I just hope to goodness until there's a ceasefire and justice that, that, that they can't be allowed to um, compete under their, their Israel they mustn't, can't, must they? No, I agree with you. Uh, apart, I mean, I don't know if it's widely known, but they've actually turned a football stadium in Gaza into a concentration camp within the concentration camp. They've got people parading around in their underwear. Old men, young boys, children in their underwear. In the January cold of Gaza, they are disappearing people, they are murdering people, they are torturing people in a football stadium in Gaza. Now, the last time there was blood on the grass, there it is, the last time there was blood on the grass was when Scotland played in the stadium in Santiago in Chile in which thousands of people had been tortured and murdered after the U.S. organized overthrow of the socialist president Salvador Allende, the rounding up of key supporters, including uh, uh, cultural icons of global significance, like Victor Jara, who were then tortured and murdered there. And then Scotland went to play a football match in that stadium. And that was our slogan, blood on the grass. You know, it's all very well, Norma. And I know because you're a fair-minded person and you love your sport, it's all very well saying keep politics out of sport. No, I didn't say Let that. I didn't say everyone... that. No, I know, I know. I'm, no. I'm saying it, that, yeah, that yeah. Uh, if you keep politics out of sport, that means you've got to play, you, you've got to go to the Olympic Games in Berlin in 1936 and, and say, Heil Hitler. Uh, we can't keep politics out of sport because no. politics is everywhere in our lives. Norma, last word to you. Well, it's just, I mean, even when they had the tennis, um, they had, they were under a, a, a neutral flag. They didn't show the names of the countries they came from. And one of the tennis players who was from Ukraine, who was a good tennis player, she wouldn't even shake hands if she lost or won against a Russian or a Belarusian player. Now, that was, I thought, stupid. But I'm talking about big teams and big participation under the name of Israel. And it can't happen. It can't. Well, uh, beautifully expressed. Uh, I don't see why the Olympic Games is uh, broken into countries in the first place. Uh, why, why don't we just put all the best Olympians uh, with the best records, with the best times uh, into the Olympic Games? Why do they have to carry a flag? Once they carry a flag, you're bringing politics into sport and events will happen where that flag is no longer acceptable in polite international uh, company. But what we certainly cannot have is some countries being banned and other countries being welcomed. When actually the country that's being welcomed is guilty of exponentially larger crimes than the country, in this case Russia, even more Belarus, uh, have, uh, have committed. So... We can't have this sick uh, hypocrisy. We have to do something 
about it. And what we should do is what Nima called on us to do, uh, to sign that petition uh, that we uh, pointed out to you uh, earlier uh, today. I want to close the show uh, on uh, a note of optimism. I believe that the ICJ will find it very difficult not to convict Israel of genocide without discrediting their entire court, the whole of the United Nations still further, the idea of law and justice. If they're ready to murder those ideas, fine, go ahead, fly in the face of all the evidence. Pretend you didn't hear uh, the Israeli leaders saying what they said, what we've all seen them saying. Pretend you didn't see the genocidal crimes being promised and then being committed. Pretend. But then don't expect anyone to believe a single word of your sick, sordid hypocrisy about international law, about human rights, about the United Nations. Tell that to the Marines. It's been marvelous, I think, the show tonight. I hope it was for you. And if it was, come back on Wednesday at the slightly later time of 9 p.m. UK time, where we hope to dive further into the Epstein swamp. I think it may be time to do that. It's been marvelous. Thanks very much for joining me on the mother of all talk shows.